Um, what you get is kind of a quick overview what, of the research that a lot of us in this room have been doing over the last couple of years, certainly, and beyond that, but a lot of focus on, on COVID, given where we are. But with an eye toward kind of mapping out, and this is what Dominique has asked me to, mapping out where our field is and what kind of science communication entails. So those of you in 902 get a little bit of a preview and we'll hear some of the themes that I gave you yesterday when I talked through the syllabus. Um, I want to start with this idea that, that I think we're in a, in a unique situation. And, and it's partly you know, US specific, but it's partly going beyond the boundaries of, of, of certainly the US and North America that we live in a world where, where science has been inextricably linked to political views uh, and you know, the, the same demonstrations that you see in, in Germany against mask wearing and, 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 and riots in, in other countries um, are reflected in some of the behaviors that we see in different parts of, of this country. And I want to bring that back to basically three different areas that, that actually map really nicely where science communication is. A, our own psychology and what's sometimes really weird and maybe, unfortunately, also not unexpected about it. Number two, though, the idea that we also live in an information ecology, if we like it or not, that takes a lot of control away from what science can actually really do because how information gets created, curated, amplified, uh, disseminated, and so on, happens in, in environments that, that are A, not under our control, and B, very often very difficult to study because they're behind um, uh, proprietary algorithms um, or governed by proprietary algorithms. And then I'll, I'll end on some of the issues uh, related to how we actually talk about uh, some of the new science and why that's a problem. And, uh, and then hopefully end up on on a more positive note and, and some challenges, but I think some challenges that are solvable and that we can work on. So let me start with the dumpster fire that is COVID um, as far as both um, the science and the communication of that science is concerned. This is a piece that Ivan Aransky and Adam Marcus wrote early in the pandemic in Wired Magazine, um, where they were unfortunately mapping out what would happen in the next few years unbelievably well. And what they were in the next couple of years, what they were saying is, look, what will happen with science is we will get, uh, with COVID is we will get a lot of the science wrong. We will retract studies. We will produce science that, that will make predictions that are wrong and will govern policy in ways that is going to be misguided. And as long as we know that now, we're going to be fine. And if we don't acknowledge that now, we're going to be screwed. And of course, we did the latter. Um, and face coverings, since we're all sitting here with now KN95s or, or N95s, um, it started by all of us going on Amazon the moment COVID hit and buying up every single piece of PPE that was available, which led then to the CDC saying, hey, by the way, yes, mask wearing is good, but please don't buy up all the, the protective equipment we need for hospitals and first responders. So wear cloth masks. Um, because that helps against asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic spread. This was early iterations pre-Delta, pre-Omicron. Um, pre Until, of course, um, in June, the WHO came out and said, hey, remember that asymptomatic thing that we said you should, this is why you should be wearing masks? That's actually very rare. That's not what they meant. And two days later, they actually walked it back and said, this is not what we meant. What we meant is it's really hard to show that and to actually show this in studies. But yes, you should still continue to wear masks. Except for by that time, of course, the, the, the genie was out of the bottle. This is, uh, this is a, a really good piece, actually, good interview with, uh, with Tony Fauci, aside from the fact that it's an awesome cover. But the, the, him explaining what had actually gone wrong, and, 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 or not gone wrong, but what had semi gone wrong in terms, of, in terms of communication. And science, of course, fed the fire, right? We're pretty openly debated um, each other and our studies, and this is what made COVID so different. COVID was different that science moved at breakneck speed, and it moved with, under immense public scrutiny, something that never happens. People never pay attention to science from beginning to end, from development of research questions, to when findings comes out. And most certainly, they don't pay attention to the process in between. So now we're, we're, we're fighting that process, or those battles, pretty openly in the New York Times. And we're fighting them at the policy front. Um, AstraZeneca was a great example um, when everybody early on was concerned about blood clots, and especially among certain demographics. 
Uh, and then the German, then German Chancellor Angela Merkel came out pretty openly saying, not only is it safe, which the US said it as well, even though we never used it and gave it away to other countries. And she came out and said, I'm actually gonna get vaccinated with this. And she said this within two weeks of Denmark saying, a country that's just a couple countries up north, saying, yeah, we're not, never gonna use that at all. So if I'm a self-respecting consumer of science news, it's safe, some politicians even get vaccinated with it, and other countries just reject it altogether as not safe, uh, and the science being inconclusive. About the same time that Ivan Aransky had written that original piece in, in Wired, um, a number of us here, uh, including Dominique and, and uh, a couple other students, wrote a piece that ended up being republished in Slate, um, How to Not Lose the COVID Communication War. That, um, and in that piece, we actually said, made a bunch of recommendations of what would need to happen in the next two years, um, many of which unfortunately turned out exactly the way we predicted. This one was an interesting one. We basically said yeah, science will have to get political. Science always is by definition political. It will have to inform policy. It will have to, to, to help policy make really difficult choices under immense time pressures. But it cannot do that in a partisan way. It cannot do that in a way where science becomes a Democrat issue, a Republican issue. And of course, this is exactly what happened. This graph is not one that you're supposed to read. I'm, I'm gonna blow up pieces of this in a second or, or, or magnify them. Uh, but this is data that Northeastern, Northwestern, um, no joke, it's Northeastern University, Northwestern University, and Rutgers have collected and keep collecting, tracking trust in different institutions around COVID and about COVID. Um, this is where the Democrats are sitting, and I'm just going to highlight Tony Fauci here and Joe Biden and the White House, so kind of the, the, the central administration um, and, their, and their branches and the mission agencies, and you see trust being pretty high among, among Democrats. And then you look at the exact same numbers about, uh, among Republicans, and some of that is, of course, an, 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 a result of an election, right? The, the, the White House and Biden, of course, are, are further down below, but the CDC and Tony Fauci are a problem. Because those are the bodies that come out and basically say the people and the, and the agencies that come out and tell us what the scientific facts are that guide policy and that tell the government how to make policy based on the best available science. And we have now moved ourselves into a world where, um, and we can talk about this later why that happened, um, but where we have two different um, worlds for two different groups of partisans. And I'll show you how that gets worse as we, as we go through the pandemic. And part of that is actually our fault. And by ours, I mean everybody in this room. Um, and how we process information and, and just the, the, the human nature. And I, um, as somebody who's grown up in, in Germany, I, I'm, I'm always fascinated by how, how quickly the Hitler comparisons come out in this country. Um, we're, for probably good reasons, a bit more careful about this in Germany. But um, Bush was Hitler because of various wars after 9-11. Obama was Hitler because of health care. Uh, Trump was Hitler because Trump. Um, and, and, you know, immigration, I think, was the, the, one of the drivers uh, for this one. So, in other words, one person's universal health care is another person's fascism. Um, and I'm putting this here, obviously, tongue-in-cheek, right? This is not, I'm not being totally serious, but it highlights really powerfully this idea of motivated reasoning, which is no, we've known since the 1980s. We've first started looking into this in political science. This idea that, that if we all agree facts are true, it's not that we don't see certain facts, we don't expose ourselves to certain facts. It's not that some of us watch Fox News and some of us watch CNN. We all agree that five facts are true. We will still each weigh more heavily those facts, confirmation bias, that fit what we already believe, that, that we hold sacred. And we will weigh less heavily those facts, disconfirmation biases, that don't fit that. So we'll just simply don't take into account all that much. And as a result, we assimilate new science into our own reality rather than the other way around. In an ideal world, what I know, what I think, what I hold sacred is constantly informed by new information, correct? Well, not according to motivated reasoning. Motivated reasoning says what I do is I take this new science and I make it fit into the categories that I already have, more as a Democrat-leaning person or more as a Republican-leaning person. And ultimately, I do that to protect my own identity. And mask wearing, this is how mask wearing has become an exercise in virtue signaling in this country. And the week here 
maybe unfairly so, showing this as, as, an, as an issue on both sides, right? This is your classic academic with tie-dyed mask and, and, and organic apples. And the Trump voter who is, you know, doesn't understand anything from the tie-dye to the organic apples to the mask in the first place. Um, but it's not utterly unfair if you actually look at some, of the, uh, at some of the data that came out of, for example, the CDC and then surveys um, surrounding that about the exact same piece of CDC information, meaning different things to different people. So this is data that was collected at the height of, of the first wave. This is in, in May of 2020. And they asked people, do you think that the numbers, the official death counts that the Centers for Disease Control put out are actually correct or are incorrect? Are they, are they, are they uh, exaggerated, um, meaning um, you know, there's, in, in reality there's, there's fewer, or are there, are there underestimates and in reality there are more? And I'll just highlight two numbers um, among Democrats and Republicans. Think about motivated reasoning. I'm a Democrat. Trump is bad, Trump is incompetent, clearly Trump is doing a poor job or was doing a poor job. Um, so clearly those numbers are, are underestimates. In reality, it's even worse because Trump is incompetent. Two thirds of Democrats don't believe the official government numbers. A relative majority, 40% of Republicans also don't believe them, but in the opposite end, because of course Trump is doing a great job, he's great, he's, he's a, a really good president, so those numbers must, by definition, be exaggerations. It can't be that bad because he's a good president. So my priors, meaning how, what I think about Trump, determines how I think about the CDC um, and, and those official numbers. So both majorities on both sides, relative or absolute, don't believe official government numbers simply based on most likely motivated reasoning. Now supercharge that. Put that on steroids. How? By putting people in an inv information environment that, that completely feeds that tendency already um, to follow our priors by feeding us even more of what we already believe. And to some degree, we, when we do all these informational, both the World Health Organization and all these other bodies right now that are saying we need to mis correct misinformation, we need to step in, we need to have all these, these, uh, these interventions, do that in a way that is utterly naive because it, is, it assumes that there is a world out there of print newspapers and television that's just waiting for the WHO to come in and tell us where we're wrong. But of course, that's not the, the world that we're living in. The world that we're living in is that we're surrounded and we're, we're being informed in an information ecology that is designed to push and to exploit errors and biases and limits of our human cognition. That's the very idea of social media. That's the very idea of, of Instagram, of Facebook, of TikTok, of Snapchat, is to basically find where our vulnerabilities are in our Achilles heels and then put more information there, keep us longer engaged on the platform at the expense of potentially truth or anything else. And that's not um, me being judgmental. That's simply a fact. That's where the business model comes. It, it's, it's a business model that prioritizes user engagement over, um, over truth. Um, and some of that may be deep fakes um, and you know, being researched in the, in the backyard of Silicon Valley. Um, some of that may be modeling our behavior in ways that we don't understand. Um, when Amazon tries to use all the social data, all the digital trace data that it has on all of us to predict what we're going to buy tomorrow so that today they can get it to the shipping center in southern Illinois and don't have to ship it in uh, because you have Prime and it's really expensive from California. So of course I want to know what you're going to do tomorrow and I want to know how the behavior of all your friends determines what you're going to do today. Um, and then, of course, ultimately that translates into informational tailoring. Um, there is not a single newspaper anymore, I mean certainly not a national newspaper, that doesn't A-B test their stories. Um, so when the Washington Post puts a science story out, it puts five versions of this online at the same time. Same story, slightly different lead, slightly different headline. Um, within 15 minutes, I know how much engagement there is on social. I know how often it gets retweeted. Um, I know all of these things. And then that is the story that eventually, wh whichever one produces the most engagement is the one that we see. So we're getting stories that are most popular. We're getting stories or headlines that drive traffic the most rather than a headline that maybe editorially makes sense or, or other things. Um, but your timelines, certainly Google searches, 
curated. Twitter searches or Twitter timelines curated, um, unless you really, really force it into a chronological timeline. Um, but you would have to really want to do that. Same thing for Facebook and for, and for everything else. So our information environment, by definition, is designed to feed our preferences, to feed the priors that we use in, in, in motivated reasoning. And to show you how bad it is, um, this is about two months ago, three months ago, uh, the Economist writing about a new Twitter report that came out and, and, uh, and where they basically have just blow up the, the conclusion here. This is a report from Twitter. Right? This is important because the report basically says, hey, you know what our algorithms do? They give the biggest boost to the least accurate sites, meaning they prioritize the least accurate information. This is like Philip Morris saying cigarettes cause cancer. Right? This is, this is a comp this is, they know litigation is coming their way. They know regulation is coming their way. When, if we have Twitter, and this is when Jack Dorsey was still in, in charge, if we have Jack Dorsey come out and say, we have a problem, we just don't know how to fix it yet, we know we have a problem. Facebook is still on the, on the denial side on, in the stages of grief. So they're still basically saying, no, no, it's not us, it's, it's the users. Um, but ultimately, and there's some truth that it's the users, that, that nobody's taking it away from that, but the algorithms end up being a, 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 a real problem, especially if they prioritize incorrect information over over accurate information. Um, that brings me to the, to the last point on, on kind of mapping the, the problem space, and that is language. Um, and in 2002, Daniel Kahneman, as many of you, who many of you know from Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, kind of the popularized version of his work, won a Nobel Prize for founding the field of behavioral economics. He, was a he still is a psychologist emeritus from Princeton um, at the time in he at Hebrew. And he won a Nobel Prize for work that originated with this study. And you can already see the creepy wording. Um, an unusual Asian disease which is expected to kill 600 people. We need an intervention. We need mask wearing. We need something. Um, but which intervention you favor depends on which condition you ended up in. Um, and these are the two conditions. Um, either I'm telling you 200 people out of those 600 affected um, will be saved, or I'm telling you that 400 will die probabilistically the exact same outcome, right? No difference, except for this is gains and this is loss. Here I'm telling you the world is gonna go to hell. Here I'm telling you, well, we can at least do something. And of course, as you can imagine, this is where the buy-in is much higher for, for interventions than here. What do we do during COVID? We communicate losses again and again and again and again and again. CNN every day having a little running tally of how many people have died now and how much worse it's gonna get, and what's happening when the second wave comes. And all these climate communication very often does some of the same stuff. So we've known this for a long time, but we haven't really done much about it. Um, this is the studies that they use to, to kind of show the original effect or to, to lead to the original effect. This is work in the, in, in the 60s out of Harvard on the broken bee stimulus. And what they try to show is what happens when we hear the 200 and the 400. Um, or the 200 or the 400, rather. So am I thinking gains or thinking losses? Am I thinking one or am I thinking three when I see that so-called broken bee stimulus? And it depends on which, which condition I put you in. And, and that early Harvard study um, that kind of came out of Gestalt psychology, this, this early uh, kind of, kind of uh, uh, German tradition of psychology, and basically in this case, of course, this is a letter, right? If I put you in this condition, of course, this is a sequence of numbers. So the takeaway is I can simply, by setting your frame of reference, by, by setting your interpretive framework, I can change how you're going to interpret the exact same stimulus. Hence the point that everything is reference dependent. How you look at a fact depends on which frame of reference I set for you, 200, 400, and so on. Uh, just for context, the reason why I have this one in there, this is a chimeric embryo. Um, that has uh, basically a pig embryo that has a, a marker turned off and then is injected with human stem cells to grow human organs. Um, point being, I can tailor organs that can be used for transplants that are not going to be rejected by the recipient. Flip side, it's a pig with a human organ in it. Um, hence, broken bee stimulus, right? How you look at it depending is on the frame of reference. That's why I put that picture there. And framing is not something that's, that's 
you know, it, it, the fact that it came out of economics implies that it's being used for sinister purposes, for commercial purposes, but we actually use it all the time. If, if I talk to you and I, I feel like what I'm saying makes no sense or is not getting across, I'm going to use a different example. I'm going to use a different metaphor. Um, Tony the Frankentiger, one of the most successful campaigns um, against science by Greenpeace, against genetically modified organisms, simply saying it's Frankenfood. Why is it so successful? And some of you have heard me say this before, because it has zero facts in it. I'm not making an argument. I'm simply tying a complex technology to a story that you have in your head. Frankenstein creating a monster, that monster getting out of the lab, destroying parts of whatever before being brought in. Um, and simply because of scientific hubris. Here is Frankenstein in the test tube when J. Craig Venter um, who sequenced the human genome on the commercial side um, when he in 2010 claimed they had uh, created life in a lab, meaning he had imputed or inserted uh, synthetic man-made or human-made DNA into a live bacterial cell and, and jump-started life, and that was the media coverage. Um, so the idea that we set a frame simply by choosing certain language, Franken-food, um, Franken-salmon, Franken-whatever, um, it helps us connect complex science to our, our underlying mental schema. And once they stick or once they're around, they're really hard to counter. Um, at some point, the beef industry, uh, the meat industry rather, sued ABC News for pink slime, which some of you may remember um, as, uh, what was that, finely textured lean beef or lean finely textured beef, one of those things. Um, and of course, it looks like pink slime. And so immediately people came up and said, that's not really beef and it's pink slime. A, um, the meat industry solution was we're going to sue ABC for using the term, for using that frame, which then led to Colbert when he, still had, when he was still on Comedy Central to devote a whole show just to the term pink slime. So the point being, once the frame is out, it's really hard to get it back in. And, and Frankenfood is a great example. Pink slime is another great example. Um, and, uh, and vaccine passports, as you will see in a second, um, is another really good one. This is one that... that uh, that uh, uh, Frank Lentz, a Republican pollster, has researched quite uh, intensively. And I, this one in the middle is a really important one. Um, vaccine passports are yet another example of government overreach. Trump voters um, and everybody else. Meaning, if you want to talk to a conservative about vaccine passports or any type of verification, the worst thing you can do is use the word passport. Um, we don't have a national ID card. Uh, we don't like to register our guns. Most certainly, we don't want to have a passport for um, our, our health status. But that changes if I switch from passport to verification. Um, and so they tried to test different frames. What would be different labels that I could use to, to increase public buy-in? And you can see, by far, the largest um, buy-in or the, the, largest, the widest margin for, for public buy-in is the idea of, of verification. And I'll come back to that in a second um, when I talk about it because industry has, has been much better at this than everybody else. And all of you are carrying, many of you are carrying an, a piece of equipment that uses exactly that language. So I want to talk about, it, as we end, about some big open questions, some of which are um, hopefully easier to address, some of which are not as easy to address. And one is, in, in, and this goes back to, a, I think, Everybody from the AAAS to the National Academies to the National Institutes of Health right now is, is holding workshops on how to rebuild trust. And it's partly driven by that graph I showed you earlier, trust in CDC and everything else. And it's partly driven by this idea that the public needs to trust science. And I'm going to say push back against that idea. I think if all of us trusted science all the time, this country would be in a really bad spot. Um, we're coming out with technology surrounding artificial intelligence, with editing technologies that edit the human germline, with interventions that, that in, in the medical field that very often ignore rare genetic diseases based on how we fund and, and regulate medicine. This is undesirable, right? Absolutely. If, 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 if there's a very low levels of trust, the, the the democratic benefits or the, the benefits for society are, are catastrophic. The, the results are catastrophic. But if we all trust science all the time, 
they're, they're also catastrophic because science is one institution and it needs democratic oversight. So this idea that we need to, ma that 100% trust, if everybody said, I trust science all the time, we would be in a bad spot. So we're somewhere in the middle where we should be. Where that is, is unclear, but I think that's a, as a really important first premise and one that may contradict some of our intuitions. The second thing that we've heard a lot during COVID is that, oh, we need to rebuild trust and we need to make sure that, especially among African-American populations and other populations that have um, received less than ideal treatment from the medical community over time, that we rebuild trust with them. And that goes back to HeLa cells and, and Henrietta Lacks. That goes back to Tuskegee um, and, and, and other things. And that's absolutely true, right? In some cases, uh, we treated groups without their knowledge. Sometimes we didn't treat groups and they thought they were being treated. Um, but that's totally disingenuous. Um, right now, if I'm an African-American mother or expectant mother, um, I have a 300% higher chance of dying at some point before or during childbirth than a white mother in this country. That's four times higher in the UK. That's not a problem of me not trusting the medical community. That is me understanding the odds, right, and saying I don't trust the medical community that gives me a 300% higher chance of dying. Is that all the medical community's fault? No. But it's not a matter of, oh, make sure, let's make sure that we rebuild trust. No, let's make sure that we address disparities in the healthcare system, and then trust will follow. But it's the wrong dependent variable to talk about we need to rebuild trust. And then I think science has, during COVID, produced some very visible missteps. Uh, UW-Madison also did wastewater testing uh, for COVID. This idea that we go to dorms and basically test wastewater for early signs of, of COVID. So when people are pre-symptomatic students, we can already see in the wastewater, and then we go in and test all of them. Um, without, without them having to show symptoms or themselves having gotten tested up to that point. Um, when the New York Times ran one of their first stories on this, this is what one of the scientists said. Um, basically said, this is exactly like Facebook. We know people are not going to like this. So what we're going to do is we're going to go on campuses, uh, which is exactly what Facebook did with the, with the, the you know, initial four IVs and then kind of branched out. Um, we're going to go in, we're going to buy, get buy-in on campus, and then once we scaled it up on campus, then the public can't do anything else but accept it anyway. To have that view as a scientist makes two, well, three points to this. Number one, my point about not trusting science all the time. Um, number two, to have this in your head as a scientist is already interesting as that that is your mindset about how your science reaches the public. Number three, you're actually saying this on the record to the New York Times. Um, you seriously need to be in our PhD minor or certificate <laughs> program. Um, and so this is part of the problem, right? That we, we end up basically pitting what we know as in, in, a, in a very asymmetric or, or, or um, imbalanced way in a much more hierarchical way uh, against where the public is. And so uh, this is, this is uh, my, my, the last uh, soapbox that I'm going to get on. But I think the, 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 this is one where I'm also not alone. A lot of people are pushing this point right now in policy circles that we're, especially when the Biden administration has, came in and said, well, s science needs to determine policy again. Science should never determine policy. Policy is determined by democratic means and by democratic groups. Science should inform policy, and it is the best available evidence that we have as a society to inform policy. But it by no means should determine policy, and it never does. Um, we know that if we all drank a lot less, lots of different forms of cancer would be much less prevalent. We know if we all drove slower, we could save thousands of lives every year. It would also take us to get four hours, it would take us four hours to go to Milwaukee. But it's a trade-off that we make, hence democratic and not just determined by science. Um, and I put um, um, Paul Offit here because he's the poster child of, of, of knowing what's good for us. And so he will routinely go out and basically say, well, we know that vaccines are safe, so we know that we need to have mandates. Two different questions. Vaccines are safe, scientific question. Do we need mandates? Policy question. First one, science can answer. Second one, science can inform. Um, so how do we make sure that science informs um, um, the best uh, the policy in the best way. 
I promised you I would come back to the to vaccine verification. All of you, when you uh, a few updates ago, when you installed 15.1, um, the iOS, uh, coming back to the idea of as well as verifiable COVID vaccination cards, not vaccine passports, but vaccine verification. Go back to the Frank Lund study. Industry has long understood that iPhones are not a Republican or a Democrat issue. They sell across and they need to sell across. So the terminology needs to resonate um, across. And, and the same thing is true for policy. Um, I would make the argument that if you, th in, a, in an extreme case, if you think about Trump's statement about the China virus and Bernie Sanders' statement about uh, socialism, neither one of these statements, they obviously have different origins, different pathologies behind them and so on. But neither one of them is meant as a cross-cutting statement. When Bernie Sanders says socialism, he wants to piss off people on the other side and he wants to rally the base. He doesn't expect any conservative to go like, socialism, that's great. Of course not, he knows that. And the same thing is true for the China virus. When Trump says China virus, he doesn't expect any liberal to go, wow, that is a, an appropriate term. But he knows that he's signaling to his base all the things that, and that, that's what I said earlier, different pathologies uh, and different origins but ultimately say motivation, which doesn't help in, pol in terms of policy buy-in. We shouldn't be surprised if we're not getting policy buy-in unless we get the language right. That also includes that we're making value proposition that matter. Um, and we've had this, I know Dominique has had this conversation with people at, uh, at Wisconsin. For many people, this was not a, a loss-framed scientific issue. COVID wasn't. It's not about 800,000 people dying. It's not about any of these things. It's about the economy. It's about people's livelihoods. It's about individual liberty. I may disagree with that, but if I want to meaningfully connect motivated reasoning with people for whom that is their guiding value, I need to be able to communicate toward that prior, toward that prior value. And Goldman Sachs, when they talked about the trillion dollar cost for the economy, or The Economist, when they talked about the cost of one person not wearing a mask for one day being a $56 loss or $53 GDP loss, and you can scale that up. Um, do that explicitly saying, I know what your questions are, I know what your concerns are, and I'm gonna communicate to and frame messages toward that. Third one, we really need to start admitting that science, especially during COVID, was moving maybe too fast, but certainly with high levels of uncertainty. And our response was, well, people don't understand science. That's the scientific process. Scientific process is, that is trial and error. I will totally disagree. The scientific process does not have a rate of, of papers getting retracted from major journals at the rate that we saw during COVID. Retracting a journal article is not normal. It only happens if it should not have been published in the first place. There's lots of stuff in the literature that has been updated, that's outdated now. Our understanding has grown. It's still in the literature. We stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Newton. We don't chop off arms of giants all the time because they're no longer useful. We chop arms off if they were wrong and they should have never been there in the first place. And, and so what we need to start doing is, and, and this is what I think happened in Wisconsin, for instance, with the, with the, with the Evers administration, when Evers goes out and says, I'm gonna close down, we're gonna keep um, uh, shelter in place requirements in, in place for another six weeks. How can you make a prediction for six weeks if journal articles are coming out on a daily basis that update the science that goes into that? So a much better policy approach is to say, look, we know the science is emerging. We know it's uncertain. We're gonna keep this in place for a week. We're gonna reassess. Um, it acknowledges the fears of, of, of citizens who want to reopen their barber shops and their bars. Um, it acknowledges the uncertainties of science. And it basically also uh, allows you to actually make better policy choices because new evidence will emerge. We do this all the time in medicine. Um, I put the, a picture here of, of chemotherapy, which is a, 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 a treatment that we still use for some cancers. Utterly crude. Right? I'm poisoning the body, hoping that the cancer dies before the patient dies. Not perfect description, but also not totally wrong. And we're making this value proposition saying, we know there's going to be gold nanoshells. We know there's going to be targeted drug delivery. We know we're going to have much better treatments, much less invasive, uh, much less damaging to the patient. But for now, this is the best we have. Um, and so we do this all the time, and we do it successfully, and we do it credibly. But for, for COVID, it became so partisan so quickly 
that we all had to be right on both sides. And, and no, we were absolutely right about COVID and there was nothing wrong with what we ever said. And so this is why we keep sticking uh, to our guns. And then ultimately, and this is uh, yet another thing I stole from work that Dominique has done with, with the National Academies and the Societal Experts Action Network, um, some of the very biases that govern our, our behavior, some of the biases that we all would like to argue don't apply to us, like for example, doing what everybody else does, right? None of us are influenced by the world around us. We're independent, we're whatever. Meanwhile, I stand here with a piece of cloth around my neck because I'm assuming that gives me high credibility or makes me look good at a photo shoot that got canceled on me. Point being, the only argument for wearing this is a social one because other people do it. Because if I sat at home and nobody had ever done this, I would not have come up with the idea of doing this. Right? So point being, this is actually in my neighborhood, a couple of houses from my neighborhood this summer. Um, and these people are putting solar on their roof. Um, why are they putting solar on their roof? Yep, because their neighbors have it. Uh, study, these people. Study after study after study has shown social contagion effects for, for energy, and for, especially for solar energy. People don't discover the light proverbially or, or literally. They, they, they don't go, oh my God, I, I can save so much energy. It's good for the environment. No, their neighbors put it on their roof and all of a sudden they're like, hmm, I could do that. Um, so the, and the same thing, of course, is true. We saw lots of, of reports, for example, of people in, in communities in Texas, elsewhere, in, com in conservative communities, getting vaccinated in secret because they didn't want their neighbors to know because they felt that they would stick out because the social norms said don't get vaccinated. Um, and, in, and so they did it in secret. Point being, social norms and some of the biases and some of the things that we're susceptible to and that sometimes have negative adverse effects can also have really be good mechanisms for communicating some of those things, and especially when it comes to things that, that or behaviors and, and motivations that have very little to do with, with information. So um, I, I try to keep it so we have at least a little bit of time to chat. Um, and. Uh, and hopefully I said enough stuff that you could disagree with so you can tell me all the things that I'm wrong on. Thank you.